Welcome to the Author's Den, a place where we encourage reading and writing, a place where you can meet authors and book illustrators, a place to get your questions answered about writing, publishing, and promoting your book. Hello and welcome to the Author's Den. Glad you could be with us today. My guest is Karen Dabney, author of The Magic Pencil. Karen, it's a pleasure to meet you. You also. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. I was born and raised in Detroit. I um, am a visual artist as well as a writer. I discovered that I had the ability to write when I was very young, but I didn't really take it seriously till I got older. You had an early affinity for writing? Yes. Talk more about that. Yes. Um, writing poems, I, I remember the most important ones that I wrote were when I was in fifth grade and our teacher had a book that we would write poems in. We'd write the poems and she would type them and then we'd illustrate them and she put them in the book and kept it in the classroom so we could read it. And then um, at the end of the year, instead of her passing them back to us, she gave the whole book to someone else. And I, that really upset me because I can remember one of the poems that I started and as a fifth grader, it was it's something I would have, would have written as an adult. It's, it was about the Vietnam War because that really touched me because I had a cousin in it. And it started out, here I am, brave and bold, sitting down where I was told, looking sharp from left to right, will the enemy come tonight? And that was fifth grade. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have that poem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to know the rest of it, huh? Right, right. I can remember a little bit more of it, but it wasn't very good. So from an early age, you were forming these things. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, you mentioned the visual artist as well. Talk about that. Okay, that's, um, I went to school for that, and it took a lot of different, t different mediums. The only one I didn't really do is things like pottery, and I did a little um, woodworking, Mostly I was in fine arts. I was doing painting and drawing, um, not much sculpture. Um, and I, I continue to do things in that field, but I haven't been as prolific lately as I have in the past. And I think that's partly because I've been channeling all my creativity into my writing. So um, that's, that's the way it's been. <laughs> You know, before we talk about your book, I'd like to know some more about uh, your early influences. What, what's your early memories of reading? Did you have some authors that you're really fond of or a book that stands out? I read so much. I re as a child, my mother had to restrict how many books we could bring home from the library because I'd bring 10. And I knew I was going to read all 10, but she didn't know I was going to read all 10. And I mean, there are just so many. Um, I really, I can't tell you some of the ones because there were so many. Any authors that, that you look back that you enjoy today even? or um, What's the last book that you read, by the way? Oh, the last book I read was, um, well, I'm reading Bud, Not Buddy, because people have told me my book is similar to that one. What's it called again? Bud, Not Buddy. Mm -hmm. It's about a young boy who's telling the story of his life and what's going on. And so people say that the voice is similar in my book, so that's why I'm reading it. And the last book that I read, I think was, um, oh, another book that was about um, a young black boy. The book was called The Bully, and I, I got that for free at a, at a a community fair, and I just decided to read that. And um, I have other books that I should be reading, but you know, the internet kind of takes a lot of your reading away from you, books. It sounds like to me like you just enjoy reading all types of yes, material. Yes, I, I like reading a lot of different kinds of books. Well, let's talk about the magic pencil. What? What? Tell me basically a little bit about the magic pencil. Okay. The Magic Pencil is a story about a young man named Malcolm Bakersfield, and he's um, doing pretty well in school, and he's got a, you know, supportive family, 
but he lives in kind of a tough neighborhood, so there are a lot of things that he has to deal with. And he's, um, he's very intelligent for his age, and he notices a lot of things, and he likes to talk um, in a relaxed language instead of using standard English, but he's just as good at doing that. And so the book is told by him, and he's telling it in relaxed language. But there are samples that show you, you know, that he knows when to switch up. That's what's called code switching. And so he's um, telling us all about his life and what he thinks about things. And then one day in class, there's a new student. And so her name is Nia, Nia Steller. And so one day Malcolm forgets to bring his pencils to class. And this is on a day where the teacher doesn't hand out pencils. She only gives out pencils on Wednesdays. So he has to borrow a pencil from her because no one else has one to loan. And so the pencil he borrows from her is, you know, it's an average pencil. They're, the kids are really into their pencils, you know, how they look, how long the eraser is, what color they are. Did they come from school? Are they, you know, do they have special things mm -hmm. on them? So she has the most raggedy pencils of everybody in the class and she bites on them and uses up the eraser really quickly and the pencils aren't long you know so when he has to borrow a pencil from her he's a little disappointed but there you know there's no one else to borrow one from so he starts to use the pencil and he notices that it glows and he looks at her and he looks at the pencil and he starts writing with it and his writing just flows you know, more naturally than it ever has before. So he looks around to see if anyone else is noticing what's going on and no one else is. So he kind of keeps it a secret, but he keeps asking her throughout the story, you know, what what is uh, going on with the pencil. And he can't get her to admit to anything or else she just kind of laughs at him. So. Um, without giving away the ending. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to stop you before you went too far. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's full of a lot of adventure that he goes through. Well, let's back up for a minute. How did this book come about? Okay, I, I got the idea for the book because I used to work as a substitute teacher. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, well, I even remember back to when I was a child, how important pencils were to us. Excuse me, how important pencils were to us and as a teacher, I really noticed it because, you know, pencils could become a problem. And you'd have to uh, stop the boys from playing leads or breaks. That's where they take another pencil and try to break each other's pencil. Um, that was, to me, that was sort of like showing wealth. You know, they had a pencil to waste. Mm -hmm. um, there were kids who collected pencils and kind of showed them off. The, then you'd have the problem of kids bringing one that's got a feather on the end and, you know, just all these kind of things. So one day I just started writing, you know, off the top of my head what I felt about this and I put it away. I didn't, you know, it's like maybe 10 pages in a composition book. And then I was accepted to a writing program and I was trying to figure out what was I going to use because you had to bring something that was already started to be critiqued. And then I remembered the story and I found the book and I started reading it and I said, this is pretty good. So I lengthened it to 13, eight and a half by 11 pages and the instructor read it and when he came to class the following day, he didn't say a word to anyone but he looked at me and he said, you're gonna make a million dollars. And I was like, Got you your know. attention. Yeah. <laughs> and he said all I had to do was lengthen the book to about 121 pages. And so I got busy as soon as I got back home. This was in um, San Francisco. So as soon as I got back home, I got busy on the book. And now it's 200. Mm. Well, in, in the, uh, eight and a half by 11, it would be like 160 something pages. But in the book form, it's 244. So he was talking about you know, 121 in book form. That inspired I you, think. didn't it? Yeah. And so um, it's geared towards young adults, but I've had adults read it and really enjoy it. Well, yes. well, well let's, let's uh, again, we don't, I don't want to give away too much of the plot, mm. but, you know, uh, 
I enjoyed the book. I just want you to know that I enjoyed it. And I, I learned some things, too, you know. Uh, it was a look at a different culture than the one I was brought up in. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, well, it, well for instance, his family life, brothers, mm -hmm. sisters, fathers, mothers, and then uh, where you drew some of that from? Okay. Um, in his family, his parents are divorced, but he's lucky because his father is still involved in his life. He has a brother that his mother had by another man earlier, an older brother. And this brother kind of grew up a lot differently from him because, I guess, because his mother was younger. And so he's kind of running the streets, you know, he's kind of becoming a little bit of a hoodlum. So his mother sends him to go live with his father. And the fathers are totally different, you know, the, where the one that is Malcolm's father is very supportive and takes him places and does things. Martin's father, his brother, you know, just sort of like gave him a key to the house and make sure there's food in there and that's it. He doesn't discipline him or, you know, really give him any kind of structure. Um, there's, Malcolm's family is, is basically very warm. His grandmother is involved. His uncle is involved with him. His sister, I mean, I'm sorry, his, his uh, aunt, his mother is, um, he has a very good relationship with her and she's raising him the best way she knows how, which is raising him to be a young man. You know, she's not um, really easy on him, but they have a good relationship. And I drew the characters from just, you know, people that I know and in my family and, you know, like how they do in movies, there's a compilation of people. Um, I feel like I <clears throat> understand boys very well. And that was part of why, you know, that when I was writing the story, it never occurred to me to write it in any other way but through the boy's voice. That was how I started it and that's how I've ended it. Well, you know, it's, I, I, there are a lot of happy scenes in the book. I, I mean, where I could see that he was learning and he was being exposed to new experiences. And I, I, that was pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could talk a little bit more about Nia? Okay, um, Nia is very mysterious. Um, she's, I like to say that she's the star of the story, or, well, Malcolm's the star of the story, but Nia's the star of the show, because she's um, very involved in what goes on in the book. She challenges him to be better. He's already getting decent grades, but because of her, he starts to get straight A's. And of course, he attributes that to the pencil. Um, she's uh, she's not your average type of girl. She's not sitting around with the other girls, chit-chatting all the time. And, you know, she's more serious. She has a lot of different ways of looking at things. And she introduces him more to, like, <laughs> African culture, for instance. And, um, even her name, he finds out when he first meets her, is Swahili for purpose. And so he enjoys learning about that. And she even challenges him to be able to answer a question that she's going to ask him later on, you know, in the story. And so she's just, she's mysterious. Well, you know, you, it was obvious to me that they spoke differently, even though you mentioned that uh, Malcolm could turn it on and turn it off. Right. Why is that? What can you compare and contrast the two, the way they talk and why maybe? Okay, well, Nia could do it also. She just tended not to. Um, that's, like I mentioned in the author's note, the way that we grew up in my family, in the house, you know, you better come in there talking standard English. You better not come in there talking so-called street talk. and in my neighborhood, it was like if you came outside talking standard English, you were going to have a problem because you were speaking too proper. You know, that's what the kids would say. So, because of that, we became what I like to call bilingual because it's actually another language when you're speaking that way. And um, even in my family, as we got older, we could see our parents do it, you know, because they weren't worried about any longer us having bad influences. 
Um, there's a scene in the book where Malcolm's talking to his mother and she's, um, she's just talking to him about whatever. And then when they get home, a friend of hers comes to visit, she starts talking, you know, in a more relaxed way. And so he mentions that he likes the way that she does that. And there's um, a part in the story, if I could read it, that illustrates what we're talking about. Sure. Um, Malcolm and his mother have just finished attending church, and later in the afternoon they go to meet up at his grandmother's house. And so that's what this is from. In the afternoon we meet up with Auntie Evelyn. I keep forgetting to ask her to look up my name in her baby name book and baby Charlotte at Grandma Sills' house. It's a two-family fat, and Auntie Ev and Charlotte moved upstairs from Grandma right before my Uncle Walter had to leave because of the war. There's a lot to eat, and I do more in my share. I also speak my best standard E, because Grandma Geraldine Silver don't play. So, Malcolm, Grandma begins, your grades have gone up, I hear. Yes, Grandma, I'm working really hard. I'm learning a lot every day and I'm trying to become more responsible. And yes, I still enjoy school. Hmm. I should hope so. Education is the key, young man, and don't you forget it. Keep your eyes on the prize. Yes, Grandma. How's that brother of yours doing? He's okay. I see him every now and then. He looks good. My mother smiles at me. Her skin is a deep, warm brown, just like her eyes. Grandma is almost tan with dark brown eyes that seem to see into your brain, just like Martin's. Auntie Eplin is almost as dark as me with hazel brown eyes like Nia's. Baby Charlotte is what some people call yellow, very light skin. It's too soon to tell what color her skin and eyes will stay. I am the darkest person in the room. My mother calls me her brown bear and Martin is her chocolate child. Uncle Walter is Grandma's caramel candy and my mother is her coffee with a drop of cream. So many colors in one family. I tug at Charlotte's little hand and say the poem my mother wrote about her when she was born. Just know she's pretty, certain she's sweet. Congratulations for giving the world such a treat. Auntie Evelyn smiles and Charlotte squirms in her mother's arms as if she knew what I said. I really liked that. And it looks to me there are a lot of different messages in the book. Can you talk a little bit about what you wanted to get across? Okay, I wanted to get across that um, children who don't speak standard English have been made to feel dumb and that they're not, they just, it depends on their circumstances. Maybe that's how everybody, maybe everyone in their family does not speak standard English. Maybe they're not doing well when they go to school in their English classes. Maybe um, it's kind of not fair because if you turn on TV and you watch the average sitcom, the white kids are not talking standard English. But it's okay because that's the one that's more known and more accepted. So it's, that's, I'm trying to get that across. And then I also want to give the kids life lessons about how to deal with negative things that are going on in their life. And I want to do it in a non-preachy manner so the book has a lot of humor in it and, you know, as you see mm -hmm. some poems and um, situations that Malcolm is able to overcome because of his supportive family and his learning from Nia and his desire to do well in life. Did you write the poems as well? Yes, I wrote. There's, there's one poem in there that my father wrote and he's, I'm really proud of this poem. He passed on but he wrote a poem about education. And um, I wrote uh, the other poems that are in the book, but the one that he's written to me is very, very special. And that one, I, I wish I could read that one to you, but I guess we don't have enough time. But um, it's, I call it this gift. He didn't even name it. And he gave my sister and I uh, reference books. He gave me a thesaurus and he gave her Bartlett's quotations. And that was when we were both under 10 years old. And so we, we started using the books. And um, his whole thing was about education. You know, that was what the whole story was about. That's nice, it's yeah. really a fond memory of that, don't you? Right, right. You know, I'm, I'm, I know we've talked a little bit about how the book came about. Mm -hmm. 
but I, I'm curious about how you actually got it published. Okay. Um, well, I took the long, hard way. I wrote the book. It took me years to write the book because I was also doing the editing. And while I was doing it, different things would happen, so I'd want to update it. And, you know, um, I had to keep about 66 characters in my head. All of them weren't major characters, but, you know, you still had to know what is this one, what do you think this one would eat, what do you think this one would look like, the, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. And I had the book self-published where I did it myself. I, I um, had the art, I didn't do the artwork, but I chose someone to do the artwork for me. And um, I had to get someone to do the typesetting, the design of the book. And then I had it printed at a printing press that does digital work. And so that's basically, oh, I had to get, you know, the international standard book number and the price and the copyright and all of that. Did you, so you didn't go to one publishing house to have this done, it sounds no, like? No, I didn't. I did it myself. So now how are you promoting the book? I'm taking the book to different stores sending it out to different distributors. I've got the book in nine stores. It's in the Southfield Library, actually. And then I have it in a couple more libraries. Um, I'm trying to get it in Detroit's main library. I also have a person who's going around the state, I mean, around the country, selling books for me. And I'm trying to get other distributors, so. It's, it's really from what people tell me, even if you were published by someone else, you still have to promote it yourself. And how's that going? It's going okay. The most books that I've sold at one time were 48. So, you know, I'm hoping that that'll happen again and again. What, what would you like to see happen with your writing, with the book? Well, I want the book to be a success. I feel it'll be a success. Um, I think about sometimes it becoming a movie or something like that, but I'm kind of leery about giving up the rights to it and seeing somebody change something, you know, and I can't say anything about it. And um, I did give the book to one of the men that works for the Michigan Film Commission. And I also think about, of course, with a book like this, everyone thinks about Harry Potter. And the way that the story ends, it has an actual ending, but it can be brought back. You know, I can do a sequel of something else that goes on between Malcolm and Nia. Is your book available on the internet? Yes, it is. Um, you can go to my website. It's dabsandcompany.com. And that's D-A-B-S and company.com. It's also available through Amazon. Um, it's... Um, Basically, other than the stores and things are listed on my website if you want to get it from a store and where to get it, what libraries carry it. Well, I want you to know I really enjoyed the book. I smiled a lot through the book. Good. And all the challenges. I can see you, you dealt with a lot of different problems in the book that a young person might encounter, you know, mm -hmm. from bullies to drugs to relationships to school and education, mm -hmm. dealing with broken homes. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy the book and I, I think other people will as well. Okay. Appreciate you taking the time to come here today. Okay, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Good luck with your book too. Thank you.